Welcome back. In this section, we're going to talk about one of the applications of the derivative, which is Newton's method. Uh, Newton's method is a way for us to find an approximate x-intercept for a function. Uh, there's lots of cases where we have a function and maybe it's difficult to solve algebraically for x. Maybe trying to find those x-intercepts by factoring, if it's a huge polynomial, might not be super easy to do. Or maybe it's some kind of a trig function where it's combined in such a way that it's really difficult to solve for where those x-intercepts are. Um, but you know that there are some. You've got reason to believe it. Um, maybe you're using the intermediate value theorem. Uh, so just to remind ourselves what that is and how that helps us, the intermediate value theorem tells you that if you've got a continuous function and if you know that at two points, at A and at B, one of those points has a y value that's above the x-axis and one of them has a y value that's below the x-axis, that since that function is continuous, it would have to cross from above to below. In other words, it would have to cross the x-axis somewhere between A and B. And that's a, an easy way for you to show the existence of an x-intercept. If you know you've got a continuous function like a polynomial, and if you know at one place it's below the x-axis and another place it's above the x-axis, well then somewhere in between the two it must cross the x-axis. So the question is, where exactly is that x-intercept? Uh, so, like I said, Newton's method uses the derivative, so probably not a surprise that it involves tangent lines. So the idea here is we're going to start off picking a point close to where we think the intercept is and then drawing a tangent line. So let's take a little look at the picture that I've drawn here. Uh, so I've got this graph, and I have no idea where the exact x-coordinate is for the intercept, but I know it's somewhere near x1. So I've used my calculus skills to find the equation of the tangent line that is at x1 to that curve. And then I draw that tangent line, and I find out where does that tangent line cross the x-axis. And that's now my second point. So x1 was my first point that I cho chose that's close to the x-intercept. I found out where the tangent line at x1 crosses the x-axis, and then that's x2, my second point. And then the whole idea for Newton's method is then we repeat the process. At x2, I'd find the point on the curve. I would draw myself a tangent line at x2, and then where my tangent line crosses the x-axis, that would be x3. And then I would repeat and repeat and repeat again. And so the thing that you'll notice, of course, is that as we repeat the process, x1 was a little bit away from the x-intercept, x2 was a little bit closer, x3 is even closer still, and so as I repeat this process over and over, I get something closer and closer to the actual x-intercept. Um, so we call this an iterative method. There's lots of these in mathematics uh, where we arrive at a solution by doing some process and repeating it. So get x1, use that to find our second x value, use x2 to find our third x value, x3, then use that to find our fourth value, x4, and by using one value to find the next, to find the next, to find the next, each time we're getting a value closer and closer to the one that we, we are hoping to find. Uh, each time we repeat that process, that's an iteration of our method. So here, let's get ourselves going and try to come up with an equation that we can use, or a, a, a formula, rather, that we can use. So we have ourselves a point, and we've created a tangent line at that point, and we want to know where does the tangent line cross the x-axis. In other words, what is x2? So firstly, I know that if I'm thinking about slopes and points, I know that the point is x1, f of x1, that's my x and my y coordinate, and my slope, I know that that is the derivative at x1. So if you're using your equation for a straight line, y minus the y coordinate equals slope times x minus the x coordinate, well, the y coordinate, that's f of x1, the slope, that's f prime of x1, In other words, the equation of our line is y equals f prime of x1 times x minus x1 plus f of x1. 
Okay, so now we're interested in where does the tangent line cross the x-axis. So in other words, we want to know when is the y value 0, uh, when uh, y is 0, x is, what is it? Uh, so if y were equal to 0, and we tried to solve for x, bring the uh, f of x1 to the other side, and divide by f prime of x. And then we can solve for what x is. So x, our x-intercept, that would be x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. And of course, our x-intercept, we said that that's going to be our second point. That's going to be our x2. So really, when I solve for that x-intercept, after using my point x1, I'm finding x2. So now I have that relation. x2 would be x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. And you could imagine me repeating this process again and again. So once I found that x2 is x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1, if I did that process again, then for the third point, x3, that would be x3 is x2 minus f of x2 over f prime of x2. Uh, so that's going to be my plan. I'm going to figure out an initial guess as to where my x-intercept is. And then I'm going to go ahead and use that formula that defined the next point in the sequence. I'll take the previous point minus f of the previous point over f prime to get that next approximation. And then I'll just do this as many times as I need to get as close as I'd like to be. So let's do this. We've got a couple of examples to work through. Uh, the first one being confirming that this equation only has one x-intercept and then figuring out where it is. Uh, so first things first, I notice that for this function it's a polynomial and so of course that means it's continuous everywhere. And the other thing that I know is that if I were to take the derivative I get 3x squared plus 1. And for sure, I know that since x squared is always 0 or larger, then so is 3x squared, which means 3x squared plus 1 is going to be 1 or larger. So in other words, this thing is always going to be positive. That means our first derivative is always positive, or in other words, the function is always increasing. And if you're always increasing, you can't have more than one x-intercept, not if you're continuous. Um, so putting these two things together, number one, we're continuous. Number two, you're always increasing, means that as we go from left to right of the graph, every, x va uh, every y value will be bigger than the y value to its left. Um, and the next y value will be bigger than the one to its left, and so on and so on. So once we cross that x-intercept, uh, every other point to the right of it must have a bigger y value because our function is always increasing. For us to have a second x-intercept would have to mean that at some point we would have to start decreasing, and we know we never do that. So putting these two things together, because the function is continuous everywhere, and because it's always increasing, there should be, at most, one x-intercept. You can have a function that's always increasing and has more than one x-intercept if it wasn't continuous. So, for example, just as a little on the side here, suppose you have a function where uh, you happen to have a vertical asymptote. So you could have the function 
increase before and be increasing afterwards and it has two x-intercepts and that's fine and that's because it's a discontinuous function but if you have a function that's always increasing and it's continuous everywhere uh, then as a result it must have only at most one x-intercept uh, now the question is does it even have an x-intercept that's easy enough to find if we just do a little poking around with some possible x values uh, if I look at x being 0, I'll find that the y value is 0 cubed plus 0 plus 1, which is 1. If I look at x being 1, I can find that the y value is 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. If I look at x being negative 1, I find the y value is negative 1 cubed plus negative 1 plus 1, which is negative 1. Um, and at this point, I've got enough information for me to stop. Uh, so number one, I can see that at x1, we're below the x-axis. Uh, sorry, at negative 1, we're below the x-axis. And at 0, we are above the x-axis. And again, because we're continuous, I can say courtesy of the intermediate value theorem, somewhere between x being 0 and x being negative 1, we'll have a y value that's between negative 1 and 1. In other words, our y value of 0 will happen somewhere in that interval. So I'm just going to summarize that and then we'll go ahead and start finding it. So at some point in that interval, uh, we will have that our function is equal to zero, and that's because uh, we had the y value at negative one was less than zero, and the y value at zero was bigger than zero. So somewhere in between, it has a y value of zero. Um, let's find out where that y va where that x value has uh, gives us a y value of zero um, you could pick whatever point you'd like to start with uh, so for this one we said that it's somewhere between zero and negative one so you could choose either zero or negative one as your first point uh, i chose when i started things off uh, by choosing zero and now let's get our little equation going here we know and i'm going to do this on the side we know that our function f of x is three uh, is x cubed plus x plus one, and f prime of x is three x squared plus one. So when I'm doing x two, that is x one minus f of x one over f prime of x one, and so I calculate away. I've got x1 is 0, f of x1, I put in 0 for all those x's and I get 1, I put in 0 for x in f prime and I also get 1, so I have x2 is negative 1. Then I'll repeat the process again using the negative 1's. Negative 1 minus f of negative 1 over f prime of negative 1. Um, and so when I did this, so let's find out f, prime, f of negative 1. We evaluate and we find that f of negative 1 is equal to negative 1. And f prime of negative 1 is equal to 4. So we get negative 1 minus negative a quarter, which is negative 3 quarters or negative 0.75. Um, so I continued on, and I found x4 in the same sort of way. x4 was about negative 0.6860465. And then using that to find x5, I got negative 0.6825. And at that point, that's good enough to, for us to stop because you can see between the last two, between x4 and x5, the first two decimal places are the same. So negative 0.68 for both of them, uh, which means that 
those first two, two decimal places, that's we've, we've achieved that two decimal place accuracy. Um, if you wanted to go one step further and find x6, then you can be even happier about what you have. I have negative 0.6823277. So you can see, compared to the previous one, it's the first four decimal places that are the same. So now if you wanted to, to say to four decimal place accuracy, uh, precision rather, um, the x-intercept should be about negative 0.6823. Okay, one last little example, and this is a, a fun historical example, um, a way of finding square roots. Uh, if you didn't have a calculator and you didn't have the ability to find out, hey, what is the square root of three? Uh, how did people do that back in the day? Well, one way of doing it was using Newton's method as an approximation. Uh, so first things first, we know that if I were thinking about the function f of x equals x squared minus three, and if I were thinking about where are the x-intercepts, the x-intercepts for this function would be where x squared is 3, or in other words, at x is plus or minus root of 3. So this is a function. We know exactly where its x-intercepts are, square root of 3 and negative square root of 3. And we're going to use Newton's method to figure out approximately where is square root of 3. Um, so, of course, we need to know where to start, and we know that square root of 1 is 1, and we know square root of 4 is 2, so we know square root of 3 should be somewhere between 1 and 2, so that's what we'll start with. We'll start with either 1 or 2 as our initial estimate, and then we will new use Newton's method to figure out uh, where is the approximate value of square root of 3. So we know that 1x-intercept happens to be at square root of 3, and we know that this x-intercept of square root of 3 is somewhere between 1 and 2. So away we go. I've got my function. And I have f prime easy enough to find. f of x is x squared minus 3, and f prime is 2x. So I'm going to start off with my first uh, selection, which was that x1, I'm going to choose 2 as my first value for that. Um, and then to find the next one in the sequence, I'll take the previous term that I found, and then I'm going to subtract f of x, the previous term, so that's the previous term squared minus 3 over previous term times 2. So I have to find the next number, take the previous one that you found minus f of the previous number over f prime of the previous number. So let's do this. Let's do this to find x2. x2, that would be x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1, and x1 was 2. And then we'll wind up with one point seven five um, so we started off with our initial guess of one point two then we got one point seven five and now let's continue on doing the same sort of thing uh, if I used one point seven five to find x three one point seven five minus one point seven five square minus three over two times one point seven five um, when I ran that through the calculator I got about one point seven three two one four two eight five seven uh, so already we have one decimal place that's the same so we already know square root of three is somewhere around one point seven um, let's get our two place precision by doing one more round of that uh, and when i did that again to find x4 i got that x4 was 1.732058. Uh, so actually, we, we didn't just achieve two decimal place 
we achieved three decimal places, so we can actually be pretty confident that square root of three is approximately 1.732. Um, and that's using the Newton's method for us to find that approximate value. A um, little bit of commentary here, though. Newton's method doesn't always work. Uh, so if you ever have a horizontal tangent line in your function, and if x whatever happens to fall on that horizontal tangent line location, uh, then Newton's method will fail. So pretend you've got yourself a curve, and you're interested in this x-intercept that's over here, and you picked a first value, and you drew your tangent line, and then it turned out that your second point happened to now be here. Well, unfortunately, when you draw a tangent line, that will never cross the x-axis. So that's what I mean by Newton's method fails. Um, of course, you can also see that just directly in the equation that the next terms in, this gonna, in the sequence is the previous one minus f of the previous over f prime of the previous. If you ever had a horizontal tangent line, the denominator would be zero. You'd have something undefined. Newton's method just would fail for you. Um, also, Newton's method can fail if you had a vertical tangent line. So if f prime was undefined, um, or just if f didn't have a derivative, that would be another way that Newton's method can fail. Um, also, it's possible that a bad choice of an initial value can lead you not to find your x-intercept and lead you away from it.